In the first tutorial, I showed you how to set up the simulation of the robot arm to hard code its movements to pick up a ball and drop it in a bin. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to use the neural network for that simulation to control the movements of a real robot. If you skip the last tutorial, you can start here by downloading the robot arm simulation setup project file from the Animalab warehouse. The new robotics framework allows you to add interfaces to an existing simulation project. So in this example, we first laid out our simulation with a robot and arm body, and a single hinge joint connecting them. Interfaces are layered and are designed to translate commands from the simulation into corresponding commands to or from the real hardware. If you've specified in your simulation that a firing frequency of X will cause the motor to move at a rate Y, then the real system will do that as well. As a motor moves, its position will be read back from the physical motor and update the position variable within the simulation component. So if you set up your simulation to trigger a neuron to fire when the motor is beyond a certain angle, then this will happen just as it would in the simulation. Essentially, with this framework, you need to know virtually nothing about programming or embedded systems to connect your simulated object up to control real robotic hardware. The first interface layer is for the main control motherboard itself. In order to run AnimatLab neural networks to control a robot, it assumes that the Animat simulator is going to be running on a small microcomputer. There are a number of these available today that are small, lightweight, and very powerful. A couple of examples that have been tested with AnimatLab are NVIDIA's Jetson TK1, the Odroid U3, and the Parallelo. Each of these have slightly different pros and cons. For example, the Jetson has an extremely powerful GPU for doing visual processing in CUDA. I plan to add GPU-enabled neural systems and vision to AnimatLab very soon using this board. However, as you can see, the Jetson is also fairly large and quite power-hungry so it may not meet everyone's needs, especially if you want to do small robots. The Odroid is very small and low power, but it's also the least powerful. It's only about four times more powerful than a Raspberry Pi, so we'll have trouble running large neural networks. The Parallela is a multi-core system that is small, lightweight, and low power, but at this time it's still a little bit difficult to use. All of these systems run the Ubuntu operating system, and the Animat simulator can run on one of these boards that's on the robot. Or if the robot doesn't move around, you can actually run it directly from your Windows desktop or laptop computer like we're doing for this tutorial. The robot interface is added to a specific organism. In order to simulate a robot, you will need to set up an entire environment for it to roam around in. But a control system will be specific to that organism. Under the interface, you can add one or more robot I.O. control systems. This is a generic means to allow the robot to talk to any number of different control or input output systems. Its primary job is to open and close the communication channel specific to that hardware and to allow individual parts underneath it to communicate in a coordinated fashion. The next layer down from the I.O. control is the robot part interface. This is what interfaces a specific hardware component to a part in the simulation. It's where the main translations between simulation behavior and I.O. to make the motor and sensors do the same thing happens. It reads the data from a specific simulation component like the desired position and velocity of our hinge, and uses that to send commands through the I.O. controller to the robotics board and then to the specific servo it's controlling. Likewise for input data, the actual position, velocity, and load is read from the servo by the robotics and then sent to the robot part interface for that hinge. It then sets those same values on the simulation object. So the simulation components have no idea that they're talking to real hardware, from their point of view, all of the data inputs and outputs operate exactly as they do under the virtual world simulations, so the neural networks interact with them the same way. Best of all, this translation is built into the code for the I.O. controller and part interface. As a user, you do not have to write any code in order to connect the various parts and have them work. You only need to worry about writing code if you want to add new types of parts or controllers. A few I.O. control systems are already available out of the box. The first is the Dynamic Cell USB Controller. This is a USB device that you can plug Dynamic Cell motors into in order to control them and read their data. However, this system has no other type of input capability, so you can only use it to control motors. You cannot read a pressure sensor with it, for instance. To do that, you would need to use one of the other I.O. systems that's available, the Fermata Controller. Fermata is a protocol that can be run on various microcontroller boards that allows a master computer to treat the microcontroller like a slave I.O. device. The master can query the board for its capabilities and then dynamically configure the pins and systems without having to add any new code to the microcontroller. 
This is typically used with Arduino control boards. You simply have to flash the pre-existing Formata sketch onto a board and it will be able to work with the master computer. The AnimatLab Formata controller is set up to talk with Formata boards to make it very easy to send and receive signals. I've also created a modified version of the Formata code that allows you to control and read dynamic cell motors using the Arbotics Arduino board. We'll be demonstrating how to use the Formata controller in this tutorial and the Dynamic Cell USB in a different one. However, it is possible to add any type of robot I.O. control system you want using the SDK. I have plans to add several different types of control systems in the future. Let's start by adding a robot interface to our organism. Right click on the arm and select Add Robot Interface. Once you add a robot interface, there's a dialog box that will show you the available options. Right now, there's only the standard interface. The standard interface allows you to right-click on an organism and select Generate Robotic Simulation. This is different from generating a standalone simulation file. It generates a simulation file that will run on the target board and use the robotics framework instead of the simulated virtual environment. You will need to transport this simulation file onto your target board to run it. In the future, I plan to automate this as much as possible and use a wireless system to directly integrate into AnimaLab to allow you to download your control system to your robot, run it, and retrieve the data and inject stimuli in real time. However, that's still in the future. The robot interface has a couple of important parameters for relating the simulation to the real hardware. The first is the robot time step. Within your simulation, you define a physics time step. However, that time step is set to allow the physics engine a sufficiently small DT so that it can calculate all the physical interactions in a realistic manner. This is typically going to be much smaller than the time step that the I.O. of a real robot will need. The time step for the robot defines how fast you want the physics portion of the robot to step. This needs to be fast enough to keep up with the I.O. requirements you have, but large enough to allow for real-time operations. This allows you to control the time step that it will be used on the real hardware. You should typically set this based on what your slowest I.O. loop is going to be. For example, the Dynamic Cell USB controller running on Windows takes around 2 milliseconds to query a given motor. If you had three servos in your system, then it will take at least 6 milliseconds to get updates for all the motors. So we'd probably set the physics time step to be 6 milliseconds. However, for that particular example, there are also some things you can do that can lower that time. We'll go over those when we talk about the Dynamic Cell USB control. For the Formata controller, we'll start with the robot time step of 2 milliseconds. Tests I've performed have shown that it's possible to get feedback from three motors in around 1.6 milliseconds using this control. There are often hard physical limits on how fast you can update your data on a real system. In order to get the simulation of the hardware as close as possible, you will need to update the I.O. on the simulation at a similar rate. This can be controlled with the Sync Sim flag. If this flag is set to true, then it will look at the settings on each of the adapters and try to match the simulated I.O. to what is seen in the real hardware. Each adapter also has a Sync Sim flag that you can turn on and off. This allows you to control this for each adapter individually. After we've added the robot interface, we next need to add the I.O. control. For this tutorial, we'll be using the Formata protocol running on the Arbotics controller. Also, you're not limited to just one I.O. controller. You could have multiple different Arduino boards performing the I.O. for your robot. You just need to add more I.O. controllers here and configure them correctly. There are several important parameters that define that configuration. The first is the COM port. This is the serial port where the Arbotics is connected. I will set this to COM6 for my particular computer but you'll need to find the specific port on your own system. The next parameter is the baud rate. This determines how fast your Formata talks. The default rate for the Arbotics Formata sketch is 115,200 baud. Please note that this is different than the standard Formata's default baud rate of 57,600. On Windows, I've successfully tested this using up to 256 kilobaud, but on Ubuntu, I've had trouble running it over 115,000, so you may need to adjust this depending on what you're running on and connecting with. Now that we have our controller configured, let's add some parts. Right-click on the Formata controller and select Add Part. As you can see, there are a number of different parts that are available, from analog input-output to pulse-width modulation and standard servo controls. 
We'll be selecting the Dynamic Cell Hinge Part. This part interfaces to the control of a single Dynamic Cell server to the movements of a motorized joint within the simulation. There are a number of part motor properties. These are predefined to match the behavior of an AX12 servo. If you need to use a different servo, then please see the help documentation for a description of each of these parameters so you can modify them to match your servo's configuration. There are only a couple of parameters that you really need to configure for this part. The most important is the servo ID. Since dynamic cell servos are networked, they are each assigned a unique ID. This parameter links this particular part interface to that specific servo. We'll leave this one set to 1. The next most important parameter is the linked part. When you click on this, you see a list of available hinge joints. When you select one, it associates this part to a specific joint within the simulation. We're going to select the TC joint. Next, the query motor data parameter specifies whether we want data on the actual position, speed, and load of the servo sent back to the simulation. If you're not using this data for anything, then you need to then you should set this to false. However, if you are using feedback on the joint position somewhere within your control system, then this needs to be set to true or you won't get that data. When it's set to true, Fermata will poll the selected motors during each update loop and send this information back to the simulator to set the corresponding values within the hinge. Finally, if reset to start position is true, then at the beginning of the simulation, the motor will be reset to their default position that corresponds with the zero angle shown in the simulation here. Setting these parameters is all you have to do to control the real servo based on your neural network. All the tedious chores of communication and making the motor move are already taken care of for you. Let's go ahead and set up the other servos and then I'll show you how to actually get your robot to move. Let's add another dynamic cell hinge part. We'll set this one to have a servo ID of 2. We'll link it to the CF joint. And then let's add a dynamic cell prismatic joint. The gripper uses a rotational motion to produce linear movement. Prismatic servo parts are derived from hinge parts, and they have a single parameter that's different. This is called the translation range. This parameter is the full linear movement that is produced from a full angular movement. It's used to convert a linear position back and forth to an angular position. For this particular gripper, set this value to 2.3 centimeters. Then let's set the ID to be 3, and then the link to be the left gripper. Now let's take a look at the real robot we'll be running so I can show you what needs to be configured for it to work. This is a test rig that I built for a set of experiments, including this tutorial. You don't need to build anything as complex, you just need to get the arm off the ground. Just like our simulation, we have three servos. I've gone through beforehand and set the ID of each one to match what, was, what we just set up within the simulation. Please see the help text at the Trojan Robotics website on how to set up the IDs of your servos using the Dyna Manager application. There will be a link to this on the video's webpage. All of the servos are connected using standard Bioloid frame parts. Models for all of these standard parts are available in the Animat warehouse, and a complete part list is available on the webpage for this video. Each servo is connected to the others in a daisy chain, and the first servo is connected to the Arbotics board. I'm powering this Arbotics board with a 12 volt, 5 amp supply. If you try and use a smaller 1 amp supply, you'll run into problems because if you try and move all three motors at the same time at their maximum speed, it will pull too much current and the motors will shut down. This will leave you scratching your head trying to figure out why your robot isn't working. 
So always make sure your power supply is sufficient. The arm also has a small pressure sensor underneath one of the gripper pads. This is connected to a small breadboard that has a simple pull-up resistor, and this is connected directly to the A1 analog pin of the Arbotics. Arduinos have a built-in pull-up resistor, and I attempted to use that so I wouldn't need a separate one. Unfortunately, it looks like this feature is not supported on the Arbotics. In the second part of this tutorial, we will download our control system into the robot and actually start